work on computers computing assistant systems and the internet of things for 15 years both as a professor now at uh, Bosch for all the center so and today we talk about the challenges in the path of trying to integrate physical systems with the cyber world and and he talk about his experience, experience on the cyber technology so once again let's welcome the speaker thank you so um, i have I have to issue a small disclaimer. This is not a prepared talk. So um, the invitation came two days ago, and I said, huh, talk, a talk about cyber physical systems. OK, I think I can pull something, something together. So I pulled something together last night after dinner. And these are the slides that you're going to see. Um, so that said, I hope to make this a, a lively interaction. I would not like to speak the whole time. And so, you know, challenge what you see there, share your opinions, share your challenges, and uh, that's what we do for. We're all colleagues. Um, I, uh, off the top of my head, I wrote down these five challenges last night. These are things that I've encountered through the years. They, they, became, they became very apparent when I joined uh, Bosch almost three years ago. So as um, you heard, I was a professor before that. And um, I've been working on this for a while and thinking about this for a while. And some of these issues have been bothering me for a while. And then when I came to Bosch and I realized, OK, now I have, instead of writing papers and working with students, I, I'm supposed to build real systems. Man, now these really become issues, right? And so how can we have? cyber physical systems that really support interactive and real-time use cases. It's not as trivial as you may think, uh, or as somebody may think. Uh, I have an issue with cloud-based systems, and I'm going to share that issue with you. Uh, reality check, there are multiple vendors out there. Uh, you're never building a system that works in isolation, you're building a part of an ecosystem. And there are consequences of that. Uh, value proposition for whom? A lot of the Internet of Things systems that are out there, they, they are engineered with corporations in mind. And they are engineered by data miners. So the value proposition that we're making is really for companies. And we have an architecture that serves the requirements of data mining. They're not serving the requirements of end users. Not all devices are created e equal. So there are assumptions that are made for the traditional internet Then when you try to hook up sensors and refrigerators and dishwashers, it's not quite the same thing. And I'll talk briefly about that. And the final one is kind of um, different from the other ones. But it's very, very relevant. Cyber physical systems, of course, we can measure temperature. We can measure a number of things. But where are the users? Where are the people? Right now, we're using devices as proxies for people. Smartphones are, is the latest edition. But people put their devices down and they walk away. They start doing things. And the system th still thinks that I'm over there. That's reality. All right, so first one, support interactive real-time uh, use cases. State of the practice are cloud-centric architectures. That's what the vast majority of the industry does. They have sensors, they have uh, aggregators in the form of device hubs. The device hubs shoot the data to the cloud. The, the data is stored in the cloud. It's mined in the cloud. So the logic, the application logic, is out there in the cloud. So data goes up, commands come down. Right? Uh, what happens to responsiveness? You have at least a round trip to the cloud. Right? So if, if you architect the, your, the light control in your home this way, you press the light switch on the wall, you wait for a couple of seconds, and if you're lucky, a couple of seconds later, the, the lights come on. And you're also depending on strong connectivity to the cloud. There is uh, a recent anecdote that I like to, uh, I, I didn't have the time to fish the, the, the real announcement. There is a real announcement. This is a real case. There's a company in the US that sells garage remote control of your garage door. Right, so you, you drive away from your home, you forget to close the, the garage door, you reach out for your cell phone, you check the status, did I close my garage door? Oh, I didn't. You press the button on your smartphone, your garage door closes. The company issued a warning to all of its customers. Server maintenance, 
don't plan on using your garage door between such and such a time on that day, right? So your smart home is turned off. It's no longer smart. Uh, challenge number two, multiple vendors out there. This leads to fragmentation of the user experience. You buy a, a Bosch dishwasher, it wants to connect to the Bosch cloud. The data that the, the Bosch dishwasher generates and the features are in the Bosch cloud. You buy a Philips Hue light bulb, smart light, wants co to connect to the Philips cloud. Right? You buy a, a, a Nest thermostat, it connects to the Nest, which is part of Google. You buy a BMW car, it connects to BMW. So in the end, our user, it does not have one smart home. It has 50 different smart things, right? Integrated experience does not exist. The systems don't communicate with, with each other. Because guess what? These companies, is, and it's not a technical channel, these companies, they have a commercial insist, incentive to keep data to themselves. It's how they derive value. They're not willing to share data with their competitors. So no matter what we do, this is not an engineering challenge that we can solve. It's in their interest. And finally, cloud-based uh, systems, they work just fine in corporate systems because you guess what? You're generating data that belongs to the corporation and often these servers, they are either owned or at least administered by corporate employees. It's all in the family, it's all in the corporation. When you look at the consumer services, it's your home. You probably don't own the servers or administer the servers. Google is going to do that for you. So you have no power over what happens to your data. You let a company hook up into the sensors of your home, you're basically signing off your privacy. The company knows whether you're home or not, knows what you're doing, right? knows who else is with you. There are a number of real products out there um, I, I talked about the, the Nest thermostat. The Nest thermostat has a presence detector, right? You can tell whether or not people are at home. Just the fact that you have a thermostat, just the fact that you have a thermometer, uh, human bodies radiate heat. So by looking at the temperature readings over time, you'll see steps in the temperature reading when someone walks into the room. If two people you see walk into the room, you see these many steps. And there was a, a, a paper published in Ubicom so one of the primary conferences um, for ubiquitous computing a few, years, a few years ago, where people were starting to look into this problem and they thought of using thermometer data to cross-reference with calendar information and optimize the use of meeting rooms in office spaces. So meetings are, uh, rooms are scheduled, people don't show up because things change, they want to know is the room occupied or not. They were using the temperature reading on, on the wall. And they could tell whether or not there was someone in the room. And then they were embarrassed to discover that whenever those two people scheduled a meeting room, the temperature bump went up, but not by two, not by two people. It went up really high, but only when those two guys were in the room alone. And then, then they went, whoops, OK, we can infer more than presence just by looking at temperature. So raw data is a really powerful instrument. <coughs> Something as innocent as a thermostat on the wall can tell a lot about what's going on in your home. There are other devices. There's a large manufacturer of, of mattresses in the US called Sleep Number, and they have a product called Sleep IQ. It's a sleep assistant. <coughs> so they manufacture mattresses, and their mattresses are adjustable, and they are adjustable independently. So, so you can adjust the, the height of your side of the mattress and that's not necessarily the same as your spouse's side, side of the mattress. They, they sell this device that, they, that you can put on the bedside side table, and the device detects snoring. So if you're snoring, the mattress moves you around so that you, know, you stop snoring. It also responds to voice commands. So, and it's a cloud-centric system. So the signal from the microphone on your bedside table is going to the cloud, is being processed in the cloud, and the command is coming back to your bed. So guess who's listening to everything that goes on in your bed? Um, so we all remember uh, the NSA uh, scandal a couple of years ago, and the issue was just phone records. 
who called whom for how long. And still people got upset. Wait a minute, the government now wants to mine the data about my phone records? Uh, then the Economist, a uh, few months back, he said, wait a minute, it's not just phone data. We're putting microphones on my bedside table. We're putting cameras on Google+. Plus. That means that whoever has access to this data will listen and see everything that I say and do. And uh, to this, when I first started talk talking about this in Bosch, uh, the reaction that I got from Bosch managers, even at the top level, is that, oh, no, 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 we're, we're a responsible company. We will never do evil things with uh, data. Uh, Yahoo is also a responsible company. In fact, they tried to protect people's privacy. So when the NSA first asked for the data, they said, no, we respect the privacy of our customers. This, that is the front page of the Wall Street Journal in September of last year, when Yahoo finally came public to what happened back in 2008, when the NSA started this program. And the NSA first asked for the data, politely. When uh, Yahoo said no, the NSA said, very good, we're going to subpoena, we're going to issue a legal subpoena to the data. If you don't deliver, we're going to fine you a quarter of a million dollars each day that you don't give the data. And Yahoo, guess what they did? They gave the data. Right? So no company would stand up to that kind of government pressure. That happened in the US. Imagine what will happen in other countries. China. And don't want to single out any country, but you know, it's more, some countries have more scruples than others in using their administrative powers. Um, the latest one is Mattel one of the largest toy manufacturers in the world. In February this year, they announced a new Barbie doll that has conversations with your child, your toddler. Barbie will ask your toddler, so what do you want to be when you grow up? Right? That kind of toddler conversation. The speech is being sent to Mattel, to the cloud, and is being stored there for two years. Okay, so Mattel will be able to analyze the intellectual development of your child, it will be able to analyze your parenting style, it will be able to listen to everything that happens around your child. It will be able to send you targeted advertising. If you yell too much, maybe you get advertising for parent parenting counseling, right? <laughs> so, <coughs> our claim is that, you know, scary as this may be, our claim is that there is really, um, Deep down, there's nothing wrong with putting microphones and cameras everywhere. We do want our cameras, to, uh, we do want our homes to be smart. We do want our, the ability to speak to our homes and to control our homes by speech. We want to, if there is a security or a health concern, we want our homes to be aware of that. If there is a, a hospital setting or a nursing home setting, we want the, the my bed or we want the bed to be aware that my elderly father got out of bed at three in the morning and never came back to it because he fell down and he could not get up. So we want the homes to be aware. We want the homes to be instrumented. So there's nothing fundamentally wrong with that. In fact, there's a lot of value to consumers. What's wrong is the software architecture behind these sensors. What's wrong is the fact that every piece of raw data is being sent to the cloud without control. It's mandatory, right? It's the way that systems are built. And that leaves open, leaves, leaves the door open for massive data mining, massive surveillance of everyone in the population. All right. I'm not getting a, a lot of challenges. I guess I'm speaking too fast. Maybe I should slow down. Um, anyone wants to chip in be here before we move on to the next uh, challenge? One thought is that we are doing all this, pushing it to the cloud for the raw computing power to yeah. analyze the data and things like that. Uh, if we have an intermediate architecture where we yeah. process the data locally, mm -hmm. many other things will not be possible. Sure, granted. So what are your thoughts on that? So how do we circumvent that? This, this solution is probably a, a hybrid architecture. So when you think that many of the things will not be possible, I'm thinking of learning, I'm thinking of analyzing vast amount of data to, to learn trends, to learn habits. I'm thinking of uh, comparing your data with the entire the, the data of an entire population to discover that certain people run into these kinds of problems or that energy consumption over here is higher in this neighborhood is higher and we uh, ask ourselves why to do those kinds of analysis i don't think we need raw data 
probably averages, probably anonymized data, um, monthly averages of energy consumption. So higher level data can be shared to the cloud and still be learned up upon. If you think about the use cases of controlling the lights, deciding whether or not to turn my, to turn my, my furnace on, seeing whether or not I'm in bed at three in the morning, right? See, it, recognizing, okay, someone got out of bed at three in the morning, they did not come back, maybe there's, there, there, there's a health complication. Just try to talk to the user. Hey, are you okay, Bob? Right? Have the home do that as a first line. If not, okay, let me give a call to your son or to your neighbor that lives next door and can check on you. If not, okay, let, let me, the smart home, give a call to 911. How much computing power do you actually need for that? Can run on your pocket, right? So there's really no technical justification to not have all of these functions run locally. Right? In fact, what has happened in our current uh, <coughs> systems is that we have somehow missed the concept of uh, of the strong sense of locale. Yeah. We don't have the concept of locale. Just like we are sitting in this meeting room, and at this point, my attention span is what is happening around me. I'm not worried about what is happening on the road. My probably that attention span is 20 percent, but 80 percent of the attention span is here. Right. But as soon as I walk out of the meeting room and I want to probably go back to Bosch. That point of time, I will start looking at my shortest route, where the where do the jam segments lie. So my local my locale locale changes again at that point. So I think this is the missing piece that is all missing in our current software architecture. Mm -hmm. There's no sense of locale at all, mm -hmm. and all of these cloud centric architectures are based on this implicit assumption that there's always connectivity. So right. a lot of these things. In fact, uh, we had a very nice. Uh, so last year we had uh, a nice little article in. Uh, uh, IoT journal actually, a newsletter, where we actually mentioned 10 challenges. And in fact, a lot of things that you're saying exactly echo with what we had put out over there. Okay, excellent. Uh, so excellent. glad to know that uh, there yeah. are other people also appreciate the same, along the same yeah. lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good, good. Well, yeah. So what about memory? Like locally, memory. we won't have that to end up storage. I don't know, memory is getting cheaper and cheaper, isn't it? I mean, if you think about your video collection or your pictures collection, it's probably going to take way more memory than any interesting data that you want your house to memorize, right? And again, do you really want your smart home to memorize everything that you said for the past two years, like the Barbie does? Maybe not. Uh, so I'm still confused about the value proposition. <clears throat> so whom are, the, whom are we making these technologies for? Are, are we making it for the government agencies or B2B? <laughs> Like business to business or business to customers? This one here. Which is the biggest customer for us? Yeah. Uh, you're talking about cloud centric uh, if, if solutions? I'm, if I'm an I, IoT maker, I mean, if I'm an OEM yeah. or a manufacturer of these technologies, mm -hmm. who, are, who am I making these technologies for? The, the current state of the art is that you're making the technologies it's for the company. And the way, so, so people, people when, when they think about this, they're not evil. They are exploring a certain family of business models. And the dominant business model out there is that data is value, right? Data has value because you can sell data, you can make inferences, you can sell other products based on data, you can give advice based on data. So let's explore data. Let's gather as much data as you want. In fact, it got to the extreme where people, us, the community building these systems, we say, Store the data, we'll figure out what to do with it later. I'm sure you've heard this, right? Um, the value proposition that we are exploring here, and I'll get to that in a second, is that, okay, we re as citizens, we're really not comfortable with that approach because it opens the door not only to corporate greed, but also to government surveillance. Um, it's easier to hack. Right, because you're putting tons of data out there in the clear, um, and uh, how about we sell privacy instead? We say, hey, your smart home is your home, it's your castle, your data, your home, your data. Pay us for the privilege. Right, we're going to sell you the products that allow you to maintain it that way. Right. So it's a different value proposition. Uh, we don't know. We don't. Know. Maybe there are people who are perfectly comfortable with. In fact, you know, think if you think of uh, uh, reality shows, 
Some people like to be filmed 24 hours a day. They like to share everything that they do, you know, how many times they go to the bathroom. They like to share that with the rest of the world. Some other people don't, right? So this is not a valid proposition for, for, for everyone. Uh, we think there's a market, there's a big market out there where people are concerned about privacy. They're concerned about privacy. They're concerned about the safety and security of their children, right? What if Barbie gets hacked? What if Barbie starts having conversations that lures your kids to do certain things that you're not comfortable with? Right. Yeah, I, I saw, I saw an, an arm shooting up. Yeah. Does there been any progress on homomorphic encryption or data mining? Yeah, yeah. Homomorphic, homomorphic encryption is, is, is a big promise. I, I might, I'm not a specialist in homomorphic en encryption. I know people who are working on that field. It's, it's, it's still a ways away. So, so the kinds of the trade-off between operating or processing encrypted data and performance is still many, many orders of magnitude be beyond what can be done for any reasonable computation other than just comparing two numbers. It's still very, very high. Sure. Uh, we have devices and all that stuff, right? So when we talk about an end user, an IoT device, usually we talk about a very memory constrained device or a distributed yeah. device. So for yeah. example, the Nest temperature sensor sure. doesn't have much range to do much, just get yep. a couple of readings installed. Mm -hmm. So at that level, you cannot expect to have a, a algorithm which you know probably encrypts the data at the sensor level. So you're anyways open that ways. So anybody can sniff and you know, a person yeah. living next by can probably sniff yeah. your sensor. Yeah. I, I, actually, actually encryption is, is, if you're talking about encryption in the local network, you probably don't need a whole lot of computation power. In fact, encryption can be done in hardware and it's really efficient. Um, I don't think that's going to be a problem to have encryption even in small sensors. And, and again, uh, the, issue, the issue is really battery because anything that deals with encryption, everything, and transmission is even worse. Every, worse. Every time you transmit power, it's even worse than CPU. Right? So having a good schema for regulating your transmission so that you actually conserve power, that's, that's really the key that will unlock, that will unlock uh, you know, having sensors everywhere. But if you think about um, wiring power for light switches, well, power is already there, right? Uh, if you think about wiring power for a lot of the, your refrigerator, your refrigerator is, is a big machine, it has power, and by the way, it also has a cooler, it's a refrigerator, so you can put as much CPU power as you want on it, it's just a matter of paying the extra 30 bucks to have a Raspberry Pi edition 2 that runs Java for ARM, you know, a whole Java engine on it, so, <laughs> right? I mean, we are talking of this Facebook generation where people yeah. are more comfortable sharing yeah. more and more data. Do you see this progressing and eventually people say, I don't care that anyway everyone knows what I do or things yeah. like that? Yeah. Uh, th that's a really good question. Uh, that's a really good question. It's a question that I've, we've been facing uh, as a community for a while, and there are multiple answers. Uh, or, or even on, I mean, Serious researchers, they did their research, they encountered multiple answers. Uh, it's very hard to, to see where things lie. People's perception itself is in a state of flux. Um, my, own, my own take is that um, the fundamental issue with privacy is the notion of expectation of privacy. Okay? So privacy is not absolute. For certain things you want to share, certain pictures that you take you want to share, Maybe some pictures you want to share with your family, some pictures you don't want to share with your family, like your wife, right? Because you were having fun with your buddies last night and you got drunk and you're making a fool of your, I was making a fool of myself, right? <laughs> and I don't want my, my, my wife to see it. So, you know, expectation of privacy. I expect to be able to control what I share and what I don't share. I'm fine with walking in here and being filmed. If I'm being filmed in my bathroom when I take a shower, I'm not super comfortable with that. Right? So it, it's really a matter of ex when do I expect to be private and when. And, and people have mental models of that. 
the problem with the Internet of Things and the problem with putting everything on the cloud is that we're breaking these expectations of privacy. All of a sudden, models of privacy that I have, that when I'm alone in my bathroom, I'm really alone, they're no longer true, right? Did I tell? I, I think I didn't tell you. There's there's a large, uh, um, uh, a large manufacturer of toilets in Japan, Toto, that has a smart toilet that does real time analysis of urine to track issues like diabetes. So you don't have to go to the hospital. You don't have to get you know, uh, complicated uh, exams to track your diabetes. You just go along your normal life. You use your restroom like you, you do it every day. And your toilet tells you, hey, your diabetes, this is the situation of your diabetes. That data is now shared to Toto. And uh, not only they can track my diabetes, they can also tell when I was having too much fun and drinking too much last night, right? So because everything ends up in my urine. So now Toto knows a lot about me. They can sell that, inf that information to my insurance company, to my employer, because, you know, uh, I had an alcohol problem in the past. I didn't. I had an alcohol <laughs> problem in the past, and my employer is not happy about that. And so imagine that all the barriers that, that uh, you expect exist, they all go away. So that's the problem, right? So when people want to share things, of course people want to share things, but they want to have control over what they share and when they share. Right? We're doing us usability studies. We, we have, we have a, a, at CMU, we have a, a good, a very good uh, school called the Human Computer Interaction Institute. And uh, we um, asked them the question saying, look, we have a conceptual model, which, which I'm going to describe in, in just a second. We'd like it, you to validate that with, with real people, not with engineers like us. So get out there, get people off the street and ask them, how do they think about privacy in their homes? And they're getting very interesting results. They're getting uh, results that people actually care a lot about what happens in their home. They care about the safety of their children. They're perfectly fine with uh, homes being smart, but they don't want homes to be smart to the point that, first of all, they endanger their families by exposing data. Like, my child, my 10-year-old, say that, my home knows that my 10-year-old child is alone at home for two hours while I go shopping. How dangerous is that? if my smart home somehow leaks that information. Um, they're also not comfortable if the smart home replaces them in their role of parents, for example. That, that was kind of a surprise for us. They also want, they said, OK, smart homes are great. Aware homes are great. Sometimes I want my home to be aware. Sometimes I want my smart home to turn around and not look at what I'm doing. They want a full, absolute private mode where not even your home is aware of anything. Your home just faces the wall and doesn't look at what you do. That's how much people care about their privacy. <coughs> so, you know, if you're not sick, if you're healthy, if you're having, you know, a friend over, an intimate friend over, and they say, you know what? Not even you, my trusted smart home, which I know they're not going to tell you this to anyone, but not even you should see what's going to happen right now. So turn around, please. Privacy. Draw the curtain. People want that. Uh, we're, not, we're not telling people that this is, this is something that they spontaneously told us. They want an absolute private mode in, in, in their homes. But of course, there's, there's um, coming back to cloud versus non-cloud and processing power. Uh, one, one of the, the challenges that we face today is processing speech. Right? So earlier, I made the argument that to control lights and to control a number of sensors, you really don't need the, the computing, computation power of the cloud, um, having a good speech analysis uh, will get there. But so far, the best speech analysis is still done in the cloud. If it's done locally, it's less accurate. Um, imagine that you already have that in your cars. Right? You talk to your cars, uh, mo mo many cars today, they, they recognize voice commands. And they recognize voice commands by shipping the, the, the voice to the cloud and, and coming back with the recognition. Um, uh, your, your Google and your iPhone, that's what they do when you use the, the voice command. If there is cloud connectivity, they'll, they'll, they'll go to the cloud. Uh, and if not, at least Google, uh, if not, it will try to do recognition locally. It's less accurate. Imagine that you are in your car and you're giving commands to your car. You're also having a conversation with the person next to you. And all of a sudden, you realize, you know what? This conversation is private. 
I don't want my car to be sending the next few minutes of interaction. I don't want you to go to the cloud. It should be easy for you to tell your car, hey, go private. So your car will stop sending the speech to the cloud. If there is a command to the car, it will analyze it locally. Okay, you'll have to articulate, you'll have to speak slower, but you are aware of that, right? And, uh, but you can have a private conversation with the person. Right. And then you can say, okay, it's open now. It's fine. I'm just discussing the latest results of cricket. So nothing private here. Uh, so having, enabling, people, enabling people on the street to have this kind of control of privacy, we, we think that this is really important. Again, coming, to the, coming back to the expectations of privacy and giving people the control to <coughs> when and where do, are they willing to share stuff and when, they, when they're not. When they want some level of privacy where data does not go to the cloud, data is processed locally, even if that means uh, less accuracy, and re retreating even more to a mode of absolute privacy where your smart home and your smart car is not even smart anymore because it's not looking. I don't want it to look right now. Right? So this, this gradation of privacy modes is something that uh, we believe it's important and our people, the people that we are interviewing, uh, they, they're telling us exactly that. People want this. Yeah. It's one uh, comment is that we should be careful about RD for the consumer space and RD for the enterprise space because Absolutely. the use cases are very different. And Absolutely. I think these are use cases more for the consumer space. Absolutely. And that's that's what I do here. Right? So something that makes perfect sense in corporate world, by all means use corporate servers because if this is not private data, it's corporate data and corporate the corporations they, they administer their servers, they, they know what to do with the data. That works just fine. If you go into consumer services, it's a different animal. That's the point that we make. Um, topology for the internet. So, so sometimes there's the, the assumption that the internet of things, it's easy. You just uh, give an IP address. By the way, it needs to be an IP address, uh, IPv6, because uh, there are not enough IPv4 addresses in the world for the devices that we want to put in the internet of things. But you give an IP address to everything, every little sensor that you have in your place, and hook it up to the internet, and you're done. Right? Um, I think that's a dangerous uh, assumption. It's, it's somewhat naive. Um, so successful apps for the internet, they, so if, if we go back a couple of decades, let's go back to the internet in, in its bloom, right? let's go back to, to the 90s. Uh, we, had, we had successful apps that run on general purpose computers, at least personal computers. So, and the, the, the kinds of applications, they entail accessing a remote service, like web browsing. I access a server, I download a few pages, or email, so I access a, an email server and shoot an email. Very much point-to-point -point communication. I go to somewhere on the internet, do something, go to somewhere else on the internet and do something else. The question is, must a sensor or an, apply, an, an appliance shoulder the burden of being a peer on the internet? So these general purpose computers, they need to have the means to protect themselves because they are, they are exposed, they have an IP address, they are out there on the internet. Can a, should a smoke detector be running protection hub and, and, and access control and all of that? That's a problem that we have today. We're, by exposing everything as a peer on the internet, we're burdening these devices with and exposing them. Should we expect your smart refrigerator to have the protection mechanisms that a, that a laptop has? Um, and on the other hand, let's think about what, what we want, what we expect to happen in your smart home. What is the application topology? Again, is it one piece of application accessing a remote service across the internet to browse the internet or to shoot an email? Probably not. So a lot of smart home applications we're going to talk, you're going to have sensors and actuators and pieces of logic in your house talking to each other. So your, your house becomes an ecosystem of, of devices where communications and processing happens within the boundaries of your home. And extraordinarily, it will go out. 
to do something. But my guess is that a very, very uh, large percentage of communication of interactions will occur in the, within the boundaries of your home. So all the use cases that we mentioned before, reacting to situations, interacting with users, deciding whether or not to turn on the furnace, deciding whether or not to talk to the user and say, hey, are you OK? Because I noticed that you're sitting there for a while without moving. Right? All, of that, all of that occurs within the boundaries of your home. So we, there's an opportunity here for us to think in terms of, OK, is the general topology of the internet where everything connects to everything is really the most adequate abstraction? Or should we have a tiered network where a lot of communications are handled locally, and then we have this other notion that there are internet or inter-home or external to the home or external to your car communications, and those need to be treated differently. And that's where privacy comes in. Right? So you probably, OK, if your refrigerator shares data with your, you, with your dishwasher, no big deal. They both belong to you. If your refrigerator and your dishwasher start talking to the outside world, that's when you get concerned. Right? So there's, again, also from the user point of view, there seem to be two worlds. What happens here in my domain, in my castle, versus what is allowed to enter and leave my castle. Right? So different patterns of communication and different security expectations and privacy expectations on the two kinds of communication. So our claim, again, is that the IoT topology should recognize these two kinds of communication patterns, that there, there's going to be, first of all, a high volume of local communication where access control is probably not a big deal. I don't want to set access control policies between my refrigerator and my dishwasher. Just talk to each other, right? But on the other hand, things that go in and out of my house, hey, I want to set my privacy policies there. What can go out? different animals again. So we would do well in recognizing the different nature of this. So our, the hypothesis that we are exploring um, at, 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 at my research group at, at Bosch is that let's try a system of systems architecture for these <coughs> internet things. So rather than having a cloud center architecture where everything goes to a server, let's have these bubbles. We call these bubbles the spheres. And you may define one bubble for your smart home, or you may define two spheres, two bubbles, or three bubbles, or four bubbles. It's up to you. It's easy to define bubbles. What goes inside the bubbles? What goes inside the spheres? You can put devices in, inside the spheres. And here, we're making a brutal simplification for the sake of usability. We're saying, if you put two devices inside the sphere, they'll see each other, they'll talk to each other. So it's all or nothing access control. We're doing this because most people are not CIS admins. They don't want to manage point-to-point -point access controls between all the different devices in your office. What we've been finding out, or rather validating, because that was our hypothesis from the start, is that people, most likely, they'll have a few, a small number of different spheres that they want to define for their homes. They may want to define a sphere where only the family has access. Things like surveillance, things like security, so things that only concern the people who actually live in the house. But on the other hand, you receive guests, you receive friends, you receive family members. You want them to have access to your TV, to your stereo, to your coffee machine. Right? So there are devices which are entertainment or hospitality devices. Put them on a separate sphere. When a friend comes through the door, you want your smart home to be hospitable to your friend. So you want your smart home to be smart to your friends, but you don't want to show everything. You don't want to open the entire network of your house, all the devices, to your friend. So just give access to your hospitality sphere, to your entertainment sphere. Keep what's, what's private, keep it private. Right? So this notion of having separate spheres makes it easy for people to administer. Again, it's just big buckets of devices. This is something that we've been validating that people also find natural to understand. And the second notion that we have, those, those green lines there, are the pipes. And pipes go outside of the spheres. So again, there are no access control. There are no privacy policies within the sphere. If you're a member of the sphere, you're, that's it. You're a member of the club, right? 
So it's very similar to being here. Right now, we are sharing the sphere. Because you came through the door and you were allowed to come through the door, everything I say, all of you listen. <coughs> it's not the case that I have to set privacy policies individually for each of you so that you can listen to what I'm saying. Right? So membership into this sphere gave you access. The minute you leave, you no longer listen to it. We're, we're doing just that. We're keeping the conceptual model simple so that people can, can, can manipulate it. It's with the pipes that we're saying, OK, pipes are dangerous. Um, pipes, first of all, they are not a blank check to go to the internet. Pipes have a beginning and they have an end. Right? Pipes start in a sphere and they say, you, your end is your parents' home. So that my parents' home can exchange information with my home and let me know when my parent is fell off of bed and is not getting up. That's a pipe between my parents' home and my home. That's it. Right? Or I may have a pipe to my doctor's office. Or I may have a pipe to Bosch. And guess what? I'm not going to send medical information or, or health alarms to Bosch. But I may want to share information about power tools, about stuff that Bosch cares. So we're, that, that's the most complicated hypothesis that people who are not, again, sysadmins, will be able to understand and manipulate pipes and be able to say, yep, I understand. They may say, well, for this sphere, I want a global pipe because this sphere is the sphere that I'm going to use to do web browsing. I want a pipe that's open. It's open-ended. Anything can go in and out. But guess what? This pipe ends in this, ends in this sphere. The devices that are in this sphere, maybe it's just my laptop and my smartphone. None of the other devices in my home are on that sphere. Right? They are separate. For those, I have separate pipes going in and out. So uh, the ability to control these access controls, uh, to, to control these privacy policies separately for different spheres, that's, that's what we're doing here. So the, that's, that's yeah, the hypothesis. I actually, I was, I was uh, speaking ahead of, the, ahead of the slide. I had a slide for that, and I had forgotten. So again, let's use this as, as a recap. So we're defining spheres of trust as boundaries of confidentiality. Uh, these are managed by users. Users create spheres, and they it's easy for users to uh, join devices to a sphere. We have, we have a use case that we call the party, and we're actually uh, working on a showcase app for that, where a, 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 a user may say, OK, I'm going to create a sphere for a party that I'm going to host tonight. And um, this sphere feature has the ability to share keys in a physical way. So your phone may generate a QR code. Can display or you can print the QR code and slap it on the wall. And so your friends who are coming over to the party, they come in, they see the QR code, they take out their cell phone, snap a picture. Your cell phone extracts the encryption key from the picture, from the QR code, broadcasts a message, say, hey, I'm here. Who else is here? So they join the sphere that way. Right? So it's very easy. You don't have to be a sysadmin to take a picture of a QR code and say, yep, I'm willing to join my friends sphere. And, and the demos, the showcase app that, that we are that we are using to demonstrate this is a music sharing, a music music sharing app. So you come to the party, and then uh, there's not necessarily one person that controls the music. I can make suggestions. If that person, if my host, open the party for guests to to, to make suggestions about music, the guests <laughs> can also make suggestions about music. So it's an easy way. It's an easy way to have some social interaction on that on that uh, restricted environment. And then the pipes. The pipes are requested by services. So when you start a service, the service may say, hey, I'm a Bosch application. I would like to connect to Bosch. Would you, like, would you allow me to do that? And the authorization is, again, is not to connect to the internet. And it's a blank check. The authorization is go to Bosch.com. That's it. That's what the user authorizes. And the middleware enforces that. So what's going to happen next? We actually have permission from uh, the president, from G1, to uh, make these binaries public. We are working in that direction. Uh, we started uh, release hand, hand delivering binaries to some of our strategic partners to get early feedback. But the, the plan is to make the binaries public uh, uh, towards the end of the year. Um, and uh, looking beyond that, um, we still don't have confirmation of that, but looking beyond that, the strategy is to open source the middleware 
so that we can really encourage uh, an ecosystem of, of different manufacturers to adopt, uh, to adopt this. So how, how will the, the ecosystem work? The idea is that we have the, the, the middleware down there. Uh, we call it Dupa middleware. That's a funny name. I, I don't know that I need to explain it. We have um, interaction protocols which um, regulate or standardize the way that services talk to each other. So how do they represent data? What kind of messages? What's the meaning uh, of those messages? So these are application level protocols or family applications. Um, and then we have services. We have a service for indoors localization. Who you work in indoors localization? We have we have a funny service for indoors localization, which is really basic, but requires no infrastructure. We call it YPIN for Wi-Fi uh, pin you down, and all it does is to do fingerprinting of signal strength. And interestingly enough, there is enough diversity in the Wi-Fi signal characteristics on each room for us just based on fingerprinting to be able to learn and then to tell is the smartphone in the kitchen or in the living room or in the dining room. We can have room by room accuracy with zero infrastructure cost. So we just take advantage of the visible access points, not just yours. So it analyzes all visible access points and takes the fingerprint of those. Um, again, low fidelity, room by room, doesn't always work, but it, it's actually pretty good, and, um, and it enables really interesting use cases. So it enables the reaction of the home to human presence in a particular room. Right? We can trigger use cases, and we have examples of them, where we, we trigger personalization of heating, personalization of lighting, uh, depending on uh, who's in the room. Um, the, the party music sharing that I mentioned, and so we have a number of showcase services that we are going to make public as, as binaries. So we're going to host those on, on, um, on the Amazon Web Services up there, along with a portal with uh, documentation encouraging developers to understand our middleware, understand our protocols, to use the, the, the services that we're going to put out there just as starters, uh, and then to download to try their own use cases, use cases that we're not supporting yet. So use cases in hospitals, use cases in nursing homes, use cases in, in regular homes. Um, build those on top of the middleware, use base or core technologies such as the indoors localization, um, and uh, try them out. And even if your, even if your use cases uh, call for some services to reside on the cloud, we have plans to also support them. So we have plans to also uh, host uh, services that the community uh, contributes to the cloud. Uh, again, we encourage communication to happen, uh, first of all, locally, but if your application requires going to the cloud for cer certain use cases, then of course we will also host that. Uh, so uh, implementations of the middleware, we have Android, we have uh, plain Java, and we have, and that's the plan for this year. For next year, we're also planning on going OSGI. There's a nice uh, implementation that you, you probably know that Bosch recently bought, bought uh, acquired the process. So it's actually a very, very good uh, implementation of OSGI. And we're planning to go to have an addition of the middleware running on process uh, by next year. And what, what OSGI gives us is the possibility, of, first of all, of software updates, but also uh, remote deployment of, of software components. So we want to support use cases such as uh, you have a smart home, computational power of your smart home is on a little server that you bought or it's on, on the really nice Thermador refrigerator that you, that you also bought, but the refrigerator doesn't have a very nice user interface. Tell you what, you download a service using your phone and using the OSGI framework, you tell the service, now go run in my refrigerator, and it goes. So now your phone doesn't have to be home anymore, the service that you just install in your refrigerator via your smartphone is now running running inside your house. Right? So that's what the OSGI will give you. So we covered the first four challenges, and we we are we have this hypothesis that, that we've been working out and, and, and trying, uh, both in terms of engineering in building the solutions, but also validating, doing early validation, both with developers and when the, with users out on the street. Uh, um, a longer term, a uh, challenge that has, has been bothering me for 
a few years actually, is uh, oh, who did it, right? So identifying users in smart spaces. When uh, we started the, the vision of ubiquitous computing uh, oh man, 20 years ago, the vision, the premise was to free people from devices, to free people from having to carry devices. Right? Back then there were no smartphones yet. Now there are smartphones which are uh, somewhat reasonable compromise and we are using smartphones as a proxy for users. But again, people lay down their smartphone. Other people borrow smartphones. Um, the traditional answer of the security community to identifying people is something you know. A username and a password. Anyone who logs in using a username and a password must be you, because we're saying so. How many of you know passwords from your spouse? How many of you log in doing a service that your spouse asks you to do, log in using your spouse's identity to do something? Does your spouse know your passwords? Um, there, was, uh, there was an article in the New York Times two years ago. There's a trend in teenagers in the US. Facebook. Teenagers, back then, I don't know if that's still the case, but teenagers were sharing the passwords to their Facebook accounts to their boyfriends or girlfriends as a token of trust. Look, you're my boyfriend, you're the love of my life, I trust you so much, here's my, the access to my Facebook page so that you can check everything, I have no secrets for you. So now Facebook sees a password and says, oh, that's little Mary. No, it's not, it's Bob. Right? So when us as security experts, we make assumptions that based on someone holding the smartphone, based on someone entering a password, password, we're really talking about Mary. We're actually fooling ourselves. We're introducing a lie in the system. So we're much better off using more sophisticated mechanisms of context awareness, factoring in multiple factors, not just a password, not just a device presence, to come up with a probabilistic model of identity. And there are no definitive answers here. When you factor on different different factors, one of the factors may say, well, this is Bob's password, but I don't see Bob's car in the driveway. It's actually Mary's car in the driveway, and I see her, her hand purse. I don't see Bob's bag anywhere in the house, but it's Bob's password. What's the likelihood that is actually Mary doing something for Bob with his consent? Right. So these, these are the kinds of reasonings that our systems need to start having instead of blindly believe, OK, it blocks password, that's why. So I actually wrote, a, this, this was work that I did as, as with, with a PhD student of mine a few years back. It's called Chameleon. But um, I did not have the chance to, to go back to it. It's very intriguing, very intriguing, very intriguing problem to, 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 to solve this one. And uh, these are the extent of the slides that I had prepared for today. So I open the floor to questions. Yeah, so we, we have five minutes of questions, so we had a nice discussion in between, so I think uh, they have given you all. <laughs> but nevertheless, are there any more questions? I have one. How do you, you, you talked about like different layers, different blobs and all that stuff. So yeah. does the user decide what data has to be shared or you know how do we decide that Know, what information has to be shared. So for example, if it's your system, yeah. or you making one sensor with the temperature sensor, some other sensor which does something else. Right. So how do we decide that whether these two sensors should talk between each other or not? Is that completely user driven or that, that that's a great question. Um, and we're not sure that we have all the answers for that question. That's a great question. Uh, the hypothesis that we that we're that we're putting out there is that okay, users want control. Uh, but users also want it to be easy, right? So we have this idea that when devices first come into your, to your, uh, to your house, so you go to your appliance store, you bring a new refrigerator to your store. The device should have a notion that's saying, hey, I'm a refrigerator. I want to gang, I want to join my gang of other appliances. 
right? And, and so uh, there, there's a natural sphere that I gravitate to. This is my suggested sphere. And if your dishwasher makes the same suggestion, your stove makes the same suggestion, maybe the user can accept the defaults that the appliances come with, and they all coalesce into something that is your home appliances sphere, right? So that said, Bob should still have control and saying, okay, refrigerator, you go on that sphere, coffee maker, you go on that sphere, and so on and so forth. So we want defaults to make it easier, but if someone, if Bob is a techie, if he likes to tinker, if he wants to configure his home his own way, he should be able to. And our mantra is that, okay, in order for Bob to do that, it shouldn't have to be a sysadmin. It should be very easy for Bob to move things between spheres. Just regarding this, is, so uh, like okay, this uh, concept is really good if we have like all these sensors which you know talk to each other and mm. they know who they are, they know what they do. But yeah. suppose if I get a nest from Google yeah. and if I have a sensor with Bosch, so Bosch sensor will probably create a sphere of its own, but it doesn't know nest. Yeah. So nest doesn't know this guy. So right. how right. will that interoperability? Right. So 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 okay. So so the the. the First part, if I understood your question right, the first part is, is to make sure that the, the devices do end up in, this, in the correct sphere, okay? Let, let's consider that it, it's in Bob's hands. So you have the default, but ultimately it's in Bob's hands. The second part is how do we make sure that if the devices are in the same sphere, how can we make sure that they actually understand each other, right? Um, that's what we're defining the application level protocols for that say, okay, these are protocols for this kind of uh, uh, this kind of information to be exchanged. For for example, we have a protocol for context awareness, where devices who generate context-related information, like temperature observations, <coughs> status of light switches, uh, whatever is is can be sensed or or, or in, in your house, there's a protocol for that based on, an actually uh, uh, W3C standard. We looked at the standard. There's a way to represent context. We said, okay, let's build on that and define our dragonfly protocol. So if the devices are, uh, are compatible with this context awareness protocol, they, they will be able to talk to each other over, over that because it standardizes the way that data is represented in the exchange. Yeah. Superman. <laughs> so your take on uh, are the Indian markets ready for this level of sophistication? The Indian markets? Are the Indian no markets idea. ready for this level of sophistication? Devices. I, I hope you know the answer to that one. <laughs> <laughs> How far in future are you trying, or do you have, or do you make specific yeah, plans? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great question. I hope you guys can can help me find the answer. So we, we started trying these context uh, these concepts out in in the United States where where we are based, but um, we would love you guys to 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 answer to to help answer that question. So. We have two kinds of stakeholders here, uh, or external stakeholders, I should say. The developer community, and the developer community, they need to understand the APIs, they need to understand the interoperation protocols, they need to find it easy to develop and drop a service into this ecosystem. That's one. We started, we started addressing that. We're working very hard to address that. The other community, or the other set of stakeholders are users who actually going to use the services produced by these guys, right? So uh, just to be sure, we don't expect, we hope that Bosch is not the only one providing services over this, but that would be the end of us. We don't want a closed system, <coughs> we want an open system where many, many manufacturers, many, many independent software applications, the software developers out there, they have a brilliant idea, develop it over our interoperation protocols, sell it on Google Play Store, wonderful. You're growing the ecosystem for us. That's that's great news. So the second kind of the second kind of stakeholders, the users, these are the ones who are, are going to answer the question: Is the security and privacy model is it easy enough or not? This whole idea of spheres and pipes, what, right? So we started validating this with real people out in the U.S. We we're having very encouraging results. Please help us um, ha answer that question here in India as well. Coming back to the first question, do developers find this easy? Um, do they def find the, the, the APIs of the middleware easy? Do, th do they understand uh, interoperation protocols? We recently uh, hosted a hackathon in our lab 
where we invited people not from our project, so people who had not seen our, uh, our model before uh, or our APIs before, and we invited them for a hackathon. And we said, here are the binaries, here's documentation, we're going to give you a set of requirements and we're going to implement it. Right? And the sec a set of requirements was a chat application. So each of the participants in the hackathon will look at the spec of the chat application, do its implementation, and said, you know, you can do whatever you why you want for a chat application. If you want a Java command line, fantastic. If you want a swing UI, fantastic. If you want to run it on an Android phone, by all means, right? And in fact, each of them did their own thing. They were all look different. What we said was, this is the protocol, the interoperation protocol for chat. This is what a chat message is, uh, should look like. This is how it should be labeled. This is what the payloads are going to be labeled. So we, we're using a markup uh, format. It's, it's uh, JSON based. Um, here's the spec, and here's the spec, and here's the spec. You all share the spec of the interaction protocols. Because our middleware is decentralized, it's published, subscribed, but it's decentralized. We don't need an event broker. Each instance of the middleware is capable of publishing and subscribing because we're implementing this over UDP broadcast. Um, you finish your app, you start sending chat messages over UDP broadcast, you finish your app, you start receiving his. There is no message broker deployed anywhere. You didn't have to take care of that. He joins in because he just finished his app, starts listening to, to everybody else's, and starts sending chats. So it's purely peer-to-peer. -peer. You are on the same sphere, that's all that they need to do, right? So the first one to, to start, they said, I'm starting a sphere, here's the QR code. Hey, guys, if you want to chat with me, here's the QR code. As, as the other guys finished, they uh, took a picture of the QR code, they joined the sphere, boom, they were in the system, exchanging messages. Um, we had uh, uh, the majority of people who were able to complete this hackathon within the same day. And they had never seen this before. So in the morning, they read through the, the, the documentation of the APIs. They understood what the protocol is. Some of them didn't even know what the protocol of interaction was. They were learning. So learning curve, learning curve, learning curve. By mid-afternoon to late afternoon, they had their chat application. Right? And uh, they gave us feedback to improve our documentation. So we're hoping that this whole day hackathon can actually be compressed into half a day if the documentation is really good. So we want to get into that. If you guys want to host a hackathon over the next few months, we'll be happy to help you Post that is a way to get, you know, to understand the model for you as developers and to get the feeling: will it help me in my use cases or not? And if not, what's missing? Because we also want that kind of feedback. Yeah. So, so this machine, machine technology, the distributed machine technology was developed by your group, or yes. have you used some open source? Uh, yeah, yeah. So we we have a, a homegrown uh, implementation right now. Uh, straight over over uh, UDP broadcast, we are looking at um, things that have been in the market for a while, which are, have a better reliability of of uh, broadcast. We're looking at zero MQ, which is you know widely available uh, in the smartphone community. It has a huge huge community, and uh, Samsung uses uh, zero MQ for example um, as uh, as a communications layer. We still have our middleware layer on top of that, which provides the security and privacy model and these decentralized uh, publish subscribe the fundamental uh, principles. We, we're using, uh, we're thinking, we're considering using 0MQ as, as a, a delivery, a decentralized delivery mechanism. Uh, we're also looking at all joints. So right now we're benchmarking these uh, three uh, technologies for, for publish subscribe and uh, gathering our numbers and we'll see how it looks. But as a software developer, as an application developer, you don't care because the API is going to remain the same. It's just what's what's the mechanism delivering the messages and how much reliability uh, you get uh, and how much performance. Right? So probably a couple of questions. Okay, just one more. We won't take any more. We are Have you talked about this uh, model of uh, like local and remote computing? Yeah. Uh, and suppose I'm giving the young guess in mind. Say the user says the car to go private. Yeah. So how the user can be sure of whether the car has ah. really gone private? Excellent, excellent. Yeah, yeah. So so there are assumptions of trust here, right? So you need to trust that the middleware is good, that the middleware is doing the right thing. 
uh, it's true, and, and that's that's a good that's a good chunk of the argument for making the uh, the middleware open source. So if it's, if it's open source, it's open to scrutiny, right? Um, yeah, and on the other hand, you can you can you can ask what's what's uh, stopping a rogue organization to develop uh, a brand of these or to develop their own implementation or a malicious implementation of the middleware and sell it. But so then again, the you as a consumer, maybe the government is putting your, your pressure on you. M malicious, mal malicious. Let's 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 uh, stick to malicious organization. A malicious organization out there develops middleware that does not do the right thing, right? That that uh, uh, <coughs> doesn't do what the user expects it to do. It's up to you uh, as a consumer to buy the middleware from an organization that you trust, right? So it can still be open source all you want, but uh, you can get it from reputable sources where you know that there is a lot of scrutiny, so you're getting a good product. Same thing when you get a car, right? You can get a car and trust that the car manufacturer actually has airbags at work and brakes at work, right? And if not, you're not going to buy that brand of car anymore, and you're going to tell your neighbor so that he doesn't buy that brand of car, right? <clears throat> So probably we'll not take any more questions. So I think we have come to the close of the session. But I'll tell you, I'm very thrilled to have you here because a lot of things pleasure. you just spoke about is something that we, from a center point of view, have been thinking very hard about. In fact, not thinking, but we have started a couple mm -hmm. of things together. Mm -hmm. In fact, when we initially started our work, uh, we divided the segment into consumer IoT space and in industrial IoT space. Because Excellent. the use case was so different, and, yes. and it's very difficult to convince users that uh, the, the this type of model fit to all use cases. Yep. So we actually made a distinction. Yep. And in fact, we have done a lot of talks on these exact principles in Bangalore. Uh, I'm really happy to and hear that. Every time we have given this talk, people are very thrilled to know about these things because the way uh, people have been thinking about IoT and the models of IoT were something very different when it comes to the consumer user space, yep. actually. That's right. And in fact, we were, we actually for the last uh, one year, we have been trying to build a couple of mid built technologies, uh, especially catered to Android uh, platforms. And so we fixed Android as a basic uh, uh, platform and a lot of development work we have done on Android. But we, I don't think we have gone as far as you guys have gone, mm -hmm. but definitely a couple of the pieces have come together. Uh, and uh, yes, as I said, I was very happy to see uh, another person who actually shares the same vision as we do. Excellent, so, excellent. Uh, as I said, we want uh, the middleware to be open, right? So uh, we'll be more than happy to adopt good ideas and we are very, very, very willing to share our ideas. Yeah. So let's thank the speaker. So we move on to meeting.